Welcome to part three of my Family Patterns video learning module series on the Big Y700 DNA test. In this module, we're going to learn all the different tools available at Family Tree DNA that helps us to understand our matches. And in particular, we're going to look at the match list, the scientific details, the time tree, and the block tree. So let's get started. And when you're at the landing page, the area of the big Y we're going to be focusing on is, of course, the block tree on the left, the big Y matches on the right, and in the center are those discover haplogroups where the time tree and scientific details are found. So the first one we want to look at is your big Y matches. And if you're used to looking at DNA matches, perhaps associated with autosomal DNA, one of the first things we always do is look at our matches. I'm actually going to recommend that you don't necessarily start here. Part of the reason is, is this is not organized in the same way we're used to seeing it with autosomal DNA, which is listed from those that are the most closely related to us, and then down to the most distant. These are organized by match date. There's plenty of great information found on here, um, and we'll talk about that in a subsequent video. But as you see, the ones that I have listed here, I've also privatized uh, <clears throat> so that I can present them to you. What I really like using, and it's my number one tool, it's the time tree. And the one I've shown you here, and of course, again, I've privatized it, is the match time tree. Both are exactly the same, except the difference is the match time tree actually maps over your matches by name and their earliest known paternal ancestor, if indicated. Now, again, I've blurred those out. But what I want to show you here is what I really like about it. So if you remember in previous videos, we identified my haplogroup as IY106972. And it's shown here with the orange dot, indicating that's my haplogroup. I have the three members here, and I'm the top one listed here. There's also two other members that are down here. They're all part of this haplogroup that, is, that I'm also a member of. But this haplogroup is what we call a parent, or sorry, a child or a sub haplogroup of the parent haplogroup. My haplogroup here is the parent, and this is a child. These two have a specific mutation that they both share that therefore enabled them to create their own haplogroup. However, the three that are part of the main parent one don't have any mutation in common that would permit the, a new haplogroup from being formed. Now, our haplogroup here that I've circled is a child haplogroup of this one and so forth. But that's how you understand. And this, what I like about it is it allows you to see your matches and it shows how distant they are. So for example, the match group uh, right above it here, you know, they are fairly distantly related to me. The common ancestor for these four right here is, and with my group where it intersects is right here. That's somewhere around the 1300s, you know, and this group right down here, uh, with respect to mine, this group here, which is not shown on the page, the common ancestor is here, which is somewhere in the 1500s. So you can kind of understand and appreciate how distantly related they are to you. And of course, the more far back in time we get, the harder it is for us to most likely find records that will establish a connection. So one of the things that I want to point out to you here as well is um, if you hover over any of these haplogroups, what's going to show up is a dialog box that shows you when your 
common ancestor that is represented by the mutation that created this haplogroup when they were approximately born. And this one says 1743. So my haplogroup here, ending in 972, was that individual who was probably the first to have that mutation was likely born around 1743. And again, you hover over any of these and it tells you that. Now, on the next slide, I'm going to get into what that actually means and how did they determine it. But I do want to point out one item here. You can see these bands that are around every haplogroup. This means that my 1743 for my haplogroup is an average or a mean. But theoretically, that ancestor who represents that haplogroup could have been anywhere born between this uh, point in time, which is right before 1600, and anywhere here, some point after 1800. So let's jump into what the next tool, which I find very helpful. It is called the scientific details, and it's also part of the haplogroups report. So again, this is my haplogroup here, as we've indicated. I also showed on the previous screen that the mean was expected to be 1743 of when that ancestor was born. Now, I don't want to get into the scientific details of this, or it's rather so much the uh, statistical aspects of this, but those bands that I previously showed are here. These are confidence intervals, and the scientists at Family Tree DNA have constructed algorithms based on sound scientific evidence to look at and say, you know, based off of the margin of error, this, that common ancestor, that time to most recent common ancestor for my haplogroup was likely born around 1743. But theoretically, it could be anywhere in this range. And there's different levels of confidence intervals depending on how strong you want that to be. In my opinion and in my research, I feel this mean or this average is really good. I have more than probably two dozen kits uh, that I've tested very, through various um, surname groups. I think I have four different surname groups. And what I found associated with their haplogroup mean is that it's pretty accurate. Maybe when you get to the older or the more um, the ones in the 1700s and earlier, it could range a lot more. But the ones closer to the present day tend to be pretty spot on, and I'll kind of show that to you. But this is a scientific details, and I think together with the time tree, this really helps you to understand your matches. The other tool that I want to show you is the block tree. And what I like about this tree is it's basically the same thing as a time tree, but really presents the data very differently. So again, I've anonymized my matches, but what you see here is again, here's my haplogroup, and there are those three members here that are part of it, but my haplogroup also is up here because we share this branch of it, but this other branch, these two share it, and they have that child haplogroup that's part of this parent one. What it shows you is how the different mutations happen across time. And I think that is very helpful to see. And in a later video, I'm going to really show you how to really interpret this. But if you're inclined to concentrate more on the haplogroup numbers and the mutations that were there to create them, this is a really good visual for it. So I thought it might also be helpful to show my haplogroup in the context of my family tree. And this would help you visualize, you know, what are the different generations that constitute my haplogroup and how does this actually show up within somebody's family tree? So here's my haplogroup and everybody in this is part of that haplogroup membership. And you remember, I have the three kits that are definitely a part of it. And then I have this child or sub haplogroup, which these two members are part of this one.
but they are also part of this parent one. And so hopefully this helps you kind of visualize how this actually shows up. But I want to add one more element to that, and that's the scientific details information, because I really think it will help you understand everything that Family Tree DNA is doing to help us understand our paternal ancestry. If I bring in those scientific details or the mean uh, to that time to most recent common ancestor, if you remember, it said 1743. Well, I know that everybody in this haplogroup here descends from this John Wilson 1784. I have verifiable documented evidence that proves it. But the mean here says 1743 when John here was born 1784. Well, the reality is, is John may not have been the first person in my line to have the mutation which created this haplogroup. It very well could have come from his father, William Wilson, or his grandfather, John Wilson. But if you look at 1743, it fits fairly well within this time frame. And maybe it's off by a decade or two, but it looks really good. And again, this builds my confidence around these um, suggested means. But let's also look at this other haplogroup, the 98226, which is a child. If we look at the scientific details, it actually shows that the common ancestor was born around 1809. And if you look at this data here, the common ancestor for them is William Wilson, but his father, William B. Wilson, was born in 1809. I think that's looks pretty spot on. Now, you might be looking to question, well, maybe Family Tree DNA knows from my family tree that William B. was born in 1809, and that's how they came up with 1809. Well, as you'll learn in another video subsequent to this one, I only knew at the point of when, we, when I was recruited these members up to this point William Wilson, William W. Wilson down. This did not even exist in my family tree, but yet they predicted 1809. And it wasn't until I did other research using autosomal DNA and traditional records that I was able to piece this together. But the fact that I had this big Y test and this approximation really helped me to kind of pinpoint within a couple of generations where the connection likely sat. And so I thought this putting it in context would be very helpful. So in summary, of the four tools that we looked at, they all have great value. The big Y matches really provides a lot of great information about the contact details for your matches, how to reach them, to email them their family tree to the extent that they've provided that. And something that we're gonna talk in the next video is about non-matching variants or what is otherwise a mutation that allows for the creation of these uh, haplogroups as well as the um, estimation for the time to most recent common ancestor. The match time tree or the regular time tree both provide the same information. However, the match tree carries over your matches and places them in the time tree. It's a great way to visualize your matches in context. And I think it's the best visualization because it not only shows you the haplogroups, but also as it progresses by time from the more ancient to the more modern. The block tree is another great way to put your matches in context, and it's a really good visualization uh, to understand the haplogroups and the specific mutations that led to the development of those haplogroups. The last one is the scientific details. I really like it because if you're into statistics or even if you're not, it provides a mean, and that's a really good starting point. It also provides uh, confidence intervals to help us understand how they got to that time to most recent common ancestor. 
but amongst all of them, my down, uh, my number one favorite is the match time tree. It is the most simple to understand, the easiest to visualize, and what really helps us to understand our paternal ancestry. So I hope you enjoyed this learning module. It, um, it is the uh, third in the series of six. So I hope you'll, um, if you haven't watched some of the other early ones, that you'll do that. And on some of the, uh, uh, the next ones, we're going to talk about how those mutations happen in module number four. And in number five, we're going to talk about how we can use our Y11 match list to identify potential people to recruit them to upgrade their test to the big Y, which will not only help them, but us refine some of our, our uh, time to most recent common ancestor and our haplogroup uh, formations. And then the last one, the, the experiment, is one that I really like, but it, it's one where we use targeted DNA testing, where we find people who descend from specific branches and we ask them to test in order to help us and them answer even more specific research questions that we have. So thank you very much, and I hope to see you in uh, future learning modules.